You're listening to the Fan to Fan Podcast. and We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Welcome to the Fan to Fan Podcast. I am your host, Bernie Gonzalez, and today's episode is a little different. Rather than talking about someone else's film, TV show, cartoon, or comic book, I'm going to tell you about my own comic. So in 2014, I launched a website, MidnightMystery.net, and it's home to the strange adventures of Detective Ezekiel King. And the series showcases everything I love about comics, uh, supernatural, popular adventures, all of that put together. So Midnight Mystery stars Ezekiel, or Zeke, who's a film noir investigator that just happens to run into paranormal cases. So he was inspired by one of my favorite shows of all time, Kolchak the Night Stalker. And if you listen to the Fan to Fan podcast, I'm sure I've brought Kolchak up quite a few times. And in that show, Chicago journalist Carl Kolchak was a regular journalist and reluctantly fell upon some very weird stories involving ghosts, zombies, and mummies. Similarly, Ezekiel King typically handles standard private investigator cases, kidnappings, infidelity, insurance investigation, and then one day a case involving supernatural elements stumbles through his office door, and rather than passing up the payday, he takes the job. And since then, he's open to more strange investigations, basically whatever makes ends meet. So, so far there are four comics, there are 40 to 50 pages in length, all full colors, self-contained tales. I also have three pro stories, each with about half a dozen or more full-color illustrations. All Midnight Mystery digital comics and stories are high-resolution, digital rights management-free PDFs, and they're viewable on a computer, tablet, and phone. The files are emailed shortly after purchase on MidnightMystery.net. So if that all sounds interesting, check out the online store at MidnightMystery.net. Each individual story is available for just $1.99. Or you can take advantage of a great deal and pick up the Midnight Sale, where you can own all of the strange adventures of Detective Ezekiel King. Midnight Sale offers all seven of the digital comics and stories, so that's a total of over 240 pages of story and artwork. And the collection includes Nature of the Beast, Dead Letters, The House That Satan Built, and a few others. And if you're on the Midnight Mystery page, you can also check out the Midnight Mystery Theater can listen to a free 35-minute audio drama adventure for The House That Satan Built. And lucky enough, that's actually what I will be sharing in this episode of the Fan to Fan podcast. So in The House That Satan Built, Detective Ezekiel King ventures into Bayou Country and encounters an eerie estate where things are not what they seem. I produced a drama in the spirit of old-time radio, shows like The Shadow and Inner Sanctum, And if you're not familiar with old-time radio, it refers to the golden age of radio broadcasting in the early 20s until the 50s, uh, before the popularity of TV, when radio airwaves across the United States were filled with radio plays, mystery adventure serials, soap operas, quiz shows, variety shows, talent shows, comedies, children's shows, musical concerts, and sports broadcasts. And some of the most famous were shows like Captain Midnight, Inner Sanctum, Tommy Dorsey Orchestra, and Gunsmoke. And they even adapted popular comic strips like Blondie, Dick Tracy, Little Orphan Annie, and Terry the Pirates. The Shadow was one of the most popular radio shows in history. That show went on the air in August of 1930, and you may recognize the opening line. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? (laughs) The Shadow knows. A 22-year-old Orson Welles starred as Lamont Cranston, and except for a two-year break between 35 and 37, The Shadow was a half-hour Sunday night radio program from 1930 to 1954. Wow. Here's another one that inspired me. While they were making 12 feature films for Universal Pictures in the mid-40s, Bethel Rasboat and Nigel Bruce, who played Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, respectively, were also heard on the airwaves on The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, which featured both original stories and episodes directly adapted from Arthur Conan Doyle's stories. So a little bit of The Shadow, a little bit of Sherlock Holmes, both of which are old-time radio shows that I love and definitely inspired me in the creation of the midnight mystery radio drama adventure, The House That Satan Built. So I hope you enjoy it, and if you like it, check out the website, check out some of the comics, and tell me what you think. Enjoy the show. Midnight 
Macabre Mystery Theater presents a tale of macabre mystery featuring paranormal detective Ezekiel King. Tonight's story, The House That Satan Built. Written and produced by Bernie Gonzalez and brought to you by our fine sponsors at Kavanaugh Cole. Don't shiver this coming winter. Order your coal now. Drive on over to your local Kavanaugh coal dealer and let them know you want to stock up before Jack Frost comes to town. Long-lasting, dependable heat. That's Kavanaugh coal. And remember, with Kavanaugh coal, you get courteous, on-time delivery right to your front door. Make sure to hold on until the end of this program for a great offer you just can't miss. Before our broadcast begins, here's some exciting news for the thousands of fellas and girls who've joined the Midnight Mystery Junior Detectives Club. If you've already mailed in your membership form, that's swell. Make sure to keep an eye on your mailbox this week. Club members will be receiving their Junior Detective badge with built-in spirit message decoder. And say, will you be tickled to pieces when you see it? If you haven't joined the club, here's all you do. Fill out your application card and send it in right away. But say, do it tonight, won't ya? And now, let the mystery begin. Country booze tastes funny. That's why I stay within the city limits if I can help it. But when an out-of-town client with deep pockets comes a-calling, I make an exception. Said client wants me to venture south, way south, and find someone that's buried six feet under in the cage and sticks. Buried for a good long time. Not that that makes a difference for most. Dead is dead, right? However, in my line of work, dead and buried is just a state of being. The lady wants me to head to the man's eternal resting place, strike up a conversation, try to rustle up any particulars about his passing. How she got wind of my services, I don't know. Some dicks shadow, cheating husbands, others playing nanny to house guests. Me? I can talk to the dead, among other things. Somewhere along the way, my client found out that the supernatural was in my purview. Nonetheless, she was nice enough to send over a map with all the details down to the tree next to the tombstone. I appreciate the legwork, but it's her hefty cashier's check that got me out of my comfy office chair and behind the wheel. I head down the interstate and begin my road trip. I'm not one for lazy Sunday drives and sightseeing, so I pour some lead in my size 10s and burn rubber. When I finally reach Bayou Country, a flat lands me bumper to Jesus in a ditch. not much for standing pretty with my thumb twisting in the night air either, so I decide to hot foot it down the road to the nearest diner. Lady Luck being on my side, Mildred tells me the cemetery is within spitting distance. I tip her extra for the directions and stiff her for the day old coffee. After a mile or so of slogging through backwoods, I reached a cemetery marker. The graveyard hasn't seen action in decades. Between countless storms and hurricanes, it's more of a wetland than a memorial. 
the grounds are covered in Spanish moss and overgrown cypress trees. The visible headstones are eroded and most of the names are barely decipherable. I pull out my map, kiss my flashlight for good measure, and canvas the marshes. After a few minutes of searching, I start getting that funny feeling. Same feeling I'd get back on patrol during the war, right before the sky came crashing down. Adding insult to injury, the fog rolls in. And not just country mist. We're talking thick as pea soup picnic on an English moor's fog. I'm lucky if I can see the brim of my hat, so you can imagine my surprise when the fog lifts long enough to reveal a pristine Victorian-era mansion 20 yards ahead of me, right in the middle of the cemetery. The building is genuine carpenter gothic. Sharp gables, angled bay windows, even a projecting tower to tie it all together. The whole place is untouched. No sign of a cracked board or a missing shingle. Not that it needs saying, but it ain't right. Pat myself down, making sure I'm not dreaming or having an out-of-body experience. None of the above. Nothing to freak out about either. In my line of business, you get accustomed to situations like this. The occult world is loaded with secret passages that take you wherever the paranormal wind happens to blow. When you're a supernatural Seamus like me, you're going to roll with the punches. Normally I'd chalk it up to residual activity in the area. Some careful walking and a few Hail Marys, and I should be home free. But I'm down to my last cigarette, so I'm working on a short fuse. I go with the roof over my head. All of a sudden, I feel like Hansel and Gretel, but I know this house ain't made out of candy. I walk into the joint and the lobby looks like a boutique and a tea party had a baby. Dark polished wood, royal purple floral wallpaper, posh tapestries and rugs, swanky all around. For a building that shouldn't be here from an era that's long gone, the hotel's held up pretty good. That's how I know things have gone from crap to weird. The fellow behind the ornate front desk finally takes his eyes off the ledger and gives me the EY. He looks like a pasty French poodle, puts down the pen, flips on the switch, and goes into his pitch. Welcome to the Manchester Manor, good sir. My name is Miles. I am here to serve. Good for you. Where the hell am I? Why, Manchester Manor, a historic Victorian. Yeah, yeah. Choke on it and listen up. I got six chambers full of Irish priest blessed lead and a fistful of sage in my pocket. So don't even think about hovering anywhere near me. We clear, Miles? I'm... I have no idea what you mean, sir. May I suggest a cozy room with a warm bed to keep the dreary weather at bay? Before I start swinging, an hourglass and a dress comes down the stairs. At first, all I see are a pair of long, glistening legs. As she makes her way down, I make my way up her figure and come to a dead stop at her face. She looks like a movie starlet in her prime. Thick lashes, hide smoky glass eyes, an endearing mole, fake or otherwise, sits on her upper lip. Plum lipstick, raven black hair complete the package. Dames like this start wars, sail a thousand ships, and make schmucks like me into poets. Miles, change my wake-up call to 8 o'clock. I'm dreadfully tired, and I just can't seem to fall asleep. Sounds like the lady needs a nightcap. How about it? A little bourbon warms the belly, a little more drops your flat. And who's our scruffy friend? I was about to ask the same question. Name's Ezekiel. Ezekiel King. Friends call me Zeke. I'll extend the same privilege to the pretty lady. Miles, as far as you're concerned, you're out of luck. Ah, well then, Mr. King, into our registered book you will go. And Miss Darrow, 
Consider your wake-up call changed. Eight o'clock on the strike of the hand. Thank you, Miles. You're a dear. Mr. King? Or shall I say Zeke? Will you be staying the night at this glorious establishment? I'll admit it's a bit out of the way, but I always make the effort to visit when I'm in these parts. Manchester Manor is inimitable. I don't know what that means, but out of the way is an understatement. Not the best day of land for a spiffy place like this, but lay up the night? Sure, why not? My car's down for the count, I'm out of smokes, and the fellow I'm looking for ain't going anywhere. Plus, I'm in Miles' book, so it's official. Give me a chance to get out of the cold, clear the cobwebs with a drink or two. How about joining me? Even if it's just for one, drinking alone ain't no way to live, scruffy or not. Unfortunately, I have to tend to my beauty sleep. But now that you'll be residing for the night, let's converse over breakfast. I'll be much more enjoyable, presentable company after some rest. Good night, gentlemen. Till tomorrow. Blended. Your table will be ready at nine. Good night, Miss Darrow. As for you, Mr. King, I'll have our boy take you up to your room. Eddie! New guest! With haste! A runt immediately darts out of the back room. Eddie's a skinny black kid with pearl peepers and flushed cheeks. Ten, eleven years old, tops. His bellboy uniform is one size too big. He trips over his long pant legs, but he turns it into a graceful bow. Grab your bags for you, mister. I'm traveling light. Eddie, show the gentleman to room 257. Room 257 it is. Come on, mister. Here you go. Room 257. After you. The room's decor keeps up appearances. Spacious and lavish from carpeted floor to whitewashed pine paneled ceiling. Strangely enough, no windows. The only light source is a brass candelabra sitting on a nightstand adorned with three burning candles. Without looking, I know I'm going to snag all the matchbooks in sight. Upscale places like this always have the best matches. The kid gives me another stare just as he leaves. He's probably sore at the tip I gave him. I kick off my shoes, throw my jacket on the floor, and hit the sack. I'm tired as all get out, but the weirdness of Manchester Manor has my mind jogging. Seen a lot of things in my line of work, but a phantom hotel? Well, that's a first. I lose a few winks trying to make sense of it all, but exhaustion gets the best of me. And I'm out for the count faster than a sailor finds a brothel on shore leave. We hope you're enjoying tonight's episode. Before we return, here's a quick word from Kavanaugh Cole. Don't let Old Man Winter catch you by surprise. Call your nearest Kevin All Cold dealer and put in your order for your winter stock today. That's right. It's not too early. Take advantage of free delivery by just listening to the end of this episode for a great deal. And now we return to tonight's mystery. Somewhere in the unconscious distance, I hear what sounds like chanting and drums. I try to shake it off and go back to dreaming about Miss Darrow's hips, but no dice. Eventually, the racket rouses me. Thing is, instead of waking up in a swanky, spectral suite, I'm tied to a wooden post in the middle of a clearing in what looks to be a stagnant Louisiana bayou. I'm surrounded by haunting cypress trees decorated with Spanish moss. A thick green fog sits above the black earth. More importantly, piles of kindling are stacked all around my feet, one spark away from lighting me up like a Salem witch. I know I'm fast asleep, but it feels like I'm wide awake. Chanting is all around me, namelessly emerging out of the encircling brush. Drums feel like they're right against my face. I come to as an icy breeze cuts through the drowsiness. 
even if this is a dream. This ain't right. I try to wrestle out of the binds, but the burly rope digs deeper into my skin with every attempt. After my wrists get nice and bloody, I give up and let the nightmare play out. The rattling tree branches and swirling dry leaves announce the arrival of a dozen wackadoos decked out in crimson cloaks. They march into clearing like a monk conga line, chanting all the way. If my land weren't rusty, I'd follow along. The head freak stops a few feet from the post. The other freaks follow suit. They go from conga line to synchronized swimmers as the disciples gracefully scatter into their positions. Before I know it, I'm surrounded. The head freak pops up his head. Stranger, you do not belong here. You're telling me I should be in bed, counting blondes and brunettes. You are an intruder. You must pay for that transgression. You must be sacrificed. Look, pal, the whole cult and caboodle thing you've got going on here is laid on a bit thick. But that's your business. The way I see it, my snoring will stir me up any minute now and I'll be out of your hair. Till then, don't mind me and continue with choir practice. And a one, and a two, and a three. Fool! You should be honored. Your blood will call upon the power of Tantan Makuti and he will use your soul to feed his children. Children, the bayou, Tantan Makuti, I should have known. It all makes sense now. Well, at least to me. Here's the play-by-play for the studio audience. Everyone's heard of the boogeyman. Hides under your bed or your closet. Scares the bejesus out of kids. Scratches your windows in the middle of the night. Hides in the shadows when you're falling asleep. You know what I'm talking about, right? Well, the legend behind the boogeyman extends beyond cultures, too. In a number of countries, he's known as a creature that carries away kids in a sack. Think evil Santa Claus. The Spanish call him El Hombre de la Bolsa. In Bulgaria, he's Torbalan. In Hungary, they refer to him as Mummus. Eastern European folks know him as a Buka or a Bebe. Then there's Haiti. Haitians know the boogeyman is Tantan Makuti. In Creole mythology, he's Uncle Gunny Sack, a beastly bagman that snatches little bambinos and eats them for breakfast. Different name, still evil. Few are offering up calves and singing the praises of top shelf devils like Azazel, Lilith, or Samuel. I almost understand. Almost. But Uncle Gunny Sack, come on, guys. He can do better than the red-headed stepchild of the demonic underworld. What do he offer you in return? Protection from mosquito bites? Immunity from heat rash? Maybe a good recipe for jambalaya? Do not dare profane his name. Tantan Makuti is not to be taunted or taken lightly. But you will see that firsthand, Mr. King. Or shall Tantan Makuti call you Zeke? Sister, whatever you think you fellas got going on here, you're in for one heck of a letdown. We're still on for breakfast, right? The head monk raises his hand, putting an end to the flirty banter. He pulls back his hood, just enough so I can see it's Miles, the front desk stooge. The smirk on his face lets me know he's enjoying this little shindig. Brothers and sisters, let us make an example of this interloper. We will use flames to purge this man's insolence and let his ashes bear witness to Tantan Makuri's glory. And if we appease our god with our sacrifice, Tantan Mukuti will reign over our spoons without end. One of the hoods makes a beeline for me, strikes up the kindling, and next thing you know I've got a ring of fire nipping at my heels. Once he's happy with the result, the hood steps back and jumps right into the heathen hoedown. I remind myself that even if this whole thing's legit, Tantan Makuti is a low-level Loa in the voodoo divinity family picture. He might have enough juice to capture my soul, my T-Bone Ange, while I'm fast asleep in my creepy but comfy cozy hotel room. He might even have enough muscle to pull my soul far enough away from my body so I can't wake up and I'm stuck in this little corner of Neverland for eternity. But I'd bet Tuesday afternoon drinking money that the little bastard didn't count on what's going to happen next. Eddie LeFay! Eddie, I know you're out there. Come on up, LeFay. All of a sudden, one of the prancing pinheads 
gets a hitch in his step. He stops dancing and looks my way. Eddie LaFay, right? Born on a sugar plantation right off the Great Mississippi River Road. Ran off at eight. Learned to play the fiddle in Storyville when you weren't shining shoes for leftovers and change. Married a beautiful red-haired girl named... Josephine. A weathered hand comes from under the robes and begins pulling back the hood, revealing the besieged countenance of Eddie Krusty Le Fay. His eyes look like milky marbles. His skin looks like faded black paint on white porcelain. Lines run through his face like cracks. The few hairs that remain sway in the bizarre swampland breeze. Eddie shakes his head a few times, seemingly trying to snap himself out of a trance. Josie. That's my girl. My wife. I... I remember her. That's right. Josephine was your wife. She was running laundry for a parlor house on Basin Street when you first saw her. Thunder on the spot. That's what you said, right? That's what I said. First time I laid eyes on her, I thunder. Done come down from God's own hand. Struck me in my chest. Start my heart cold. Knew it from the get-go she was going to be my one and only. Sure did. Spent two weeks earnings just so I could rustle up me some pants and had no patches. Just wouldn't seem right talking to that angel with holes in my pants. And why'd they call you Krusty? Tell me, Eddie. Tell these sons of bitches. They... They called me Krusty. Because I'd eat the bread crust. Eat it up. No problem. Didn't matter to me none. You know, tastes just fine on an empty stomach. I ain't put thought in that in. And I can't remember. Feels like I've been swimming in honey for a long time. Who are you, mister? Where did you come from? How do you know this stuff about me? My name's King. Your daughter, Muriel, she hired me. She's alive, and she sent me after you. Muriel? Oh, my dear Lord. Muriel. Josephine. Where are they? Can you help me find them? I can try. But first things first, Eddie. First you gotta pass. Pass? Pass what? More like where. I'm here to help you pass to the hereafter. Heaven, hell, whatever you got coming. But you can't stay here. Not anymore. It's time to move on. Enough! Mr. LaFay, you made a deal with Tanun Makunte. The same deal we all made. This this Mr. King thinks he can help you move on. Move on, he says. Really? What influence does he have while he's all tied up, ready to be sacrificed to our master? And even if he possesses such power in releasing you from your bond... Your precious daughter will lose her precious life. Uh, nope. Uh, pardon me, Mr. King. I said nope. So you made a deal with the devil. Eddie, sorry, but dumb move. But it was more like a deal with a devil. Tatoon Makunte is so far down the demon totem pole that he sucks dirt wholesale. Didn't take more than some old time hoodooing to lift the hex didn't even break a sweat just had to find your grave to make the whole thing official Muriel she's fine and dandy she's even in the PTA Tatoon Makunti has nothing on you you can come and go as you please you just have to be ready how? that's easy walk through the roaring fire put your hand in my left coat pocket and grab your root bag to freedom that last comment catches everyone's attention. Not that I'm surprised. A root bag by any other name is still the same. Mojo hand, conjure bag, trip bag, Toby, Jomo, Grizz Grizz bag. Call it what you will, but it's what's inside that counts. An effective root bag is filled with everything you need to get the job done. In this case, I'm trying to remove a hex and bring Eddie back from the clutches of Uncle Gunny Sack. This time, my flannel bag's got a broken length of chain, a busted ring, a rat bone, 
a cat's eye shell, a pinch of five-finger grass, and a miniature hand-carved skull from yak bone, all soaked in uncrossing oil. Miles's tongue starts twisting like a snake. He is lying, Eddie. A stupid bag won't bring you relief. If you move on, your daughter will die. Like your wife, Josephine. Isn't that why you made the deal? Josephine was giving birth to Muriel when the doctor lost her pulse. She was slipping away with your one and only child. You would have lost them both, but you reached out to the darkness, and the great Tatun Makunte heard your proposition. Your life, your soul, for the life of your daughter. That was the deal, right? Josephine was lost. There was nothing you could do, but Muriel could be saved. That's exactly what you did. Stay here, Eddie. Stay with us. It isn't so bad, is it? When's the last time you felt pain, sorrow, regret? You can forget all of this. The pain of your past. Tantan Makuti helps you forget before. He can do it again. Stay. The smoke starts getting to me. Nightmare or not, breathing's becoming a hardship. Miles' bullshit pitch doesn't help. Time to close up shop and go home. I'm not lying. Muriel is fine. She's gonna stay that way. To tune whatever? Honestly, I'm getting sick of saying his damn name. The wicked wannabe can't touch her. This is about you. Your choice. Grab the bag and we're out of here. Or don't. Just let me know which way you're leaning so I can start making a daring escape if need be. As the supernatural sweat drips down my forehead, Eddie contemplates. I can empathize with the guy. Seeing my wife knocking on death's door with my kid in tow would break me seven days a week. Not that hard to imagine mouthing out a faint help me to anyone that might be listening. And if a devil happens to be the first one to return my call, in that situation I'd be inclined to answer even if it meant offering up my soul. When it comes down to it, Eddie's been a prisoner since 1868. He's going on over 70 years in Tantan Makunti's personal hell. Sure, the demons made it out to look like a mansion, threw in a knockout in Mistero and room service for good measure. He even made poor Eddie the bellboy. It's not sulfur and brimstone, but the hotel is still damnation. Thing is, for Eddie it's been a comfy, cursed cage. Muriel may have paid me to hunt her father down in limbo, find a way to break the enchantment, and help him on his way. But ultimately, Eddie Krusty Le Fay has to make the call. I make eyes with him. So what do you say, Krusty? I, I'm staying. I ain't here to count on Muriel, Mr. King. By the time my baby girl came around, I had no soul to sell. She had given that up sometime prior. I gave my spirit to Tuna Makunte so Josephine would fall in love with me. That's what he saved Muriel. Fair enough. Anything you want me to say to Muriel? Tell her. Tell her she was born out of love. True love. The rest is for me to answer for. That was a beautiful moment, Mr. King, but you won't be leaving. Not now, not ever. Maybe Tanta Makunte will devour you so quickly treat you as a measly hors d'oeuvre to slack in his hunger, or he'll gnaw on it for decades, grinding his teeth leisurely into your essence until he decides to take a bite. Either way, you are his. Appreciate the offer, but I have half a bottle of whiskey sitting on my office desk with my name on it, and it's not going to drink itself. Really? And how exactly did you intend to make your so-called daring getaway. My big mouth. Not that I want to tell you guys how to do your job, but you might want to invest in a gag next time around. I close my eyes and reset an ancient chant. Papa Ligba, umba umbe umbe, agoe. Papa Limba, umba umbe unge. Papa Linga, umba umbe umbe. Liam tum, liam tua. The second I utter the last syllable, my stomach drops into my shoes. It feels like I'm falling off the Empire State Building. Sensation overcomes me, and I black out. Just hope when I open my eyes, first thing I see won't be Tanta Makunte's pearly whites digging into my overcooked soul.
The waitress tops off my third cup of coffee before dropping the change on the counter. I downed a cup of joe, snatched the change, and make my way to the payphone. After blacking out in limbo or wherever that motel netherworld was, I woke up face down on the highway just past the witching hour. After patting myself down, making sure all my parts were intact and free of char marks, I started making my way toward civilization. A state trooper eventually came along, chalked me up as a dog-tired hitchhiker, and was kind enough to give me a ride to the nearest diner. I dig through my pockets, find the crumbled note, and slip the currency into the slot. Once I hear the tone, I dial the number on the paper and wait for the response. The line barely rings a second before I hear a voice. Mr. King? Is that you? Did you... Did you find my father? Evening, Miss Connolly. I, I, I did. I found your dad. Just like you asked. Where is he? That's um difficult to say. Like I said when you first called, matters like this just don't have the concrete answers most folks are looking for. Someone jumps off a bridge, the police can drain a lake and find the body. But if someone wanders into the woods, never to be seen again, running out all the search dogs in the world doesn't guarantee you'll find anything. It's basically what happened to your father, Miss Connolly. He wandered into the woods, and he's been in the thick of it for a very long time. Long enough that he, he can't come back. Is that the truth? Or are you trying to spare my feelings? paid you to find him and pull him out of his limbo. You said you could do that if circumstances were in his favor. What the circumstances are, I have no idea. But I'm aware of your reputation in these matters, so I trusted you. And I still do. I just want some closure. No talking down. No placating. No false hope. I want to know that my father is where he belongs. Be it heaven or hell. As long as he's not stuck in the middle because of me, because of his sacrifice to bring me into this world, I'm content with the outcome. He's where he wants to be, Miss Connolly, of his own accord. And you don't figure into that choice. She was born out of love, true love. The rest is for me to answer for. His words. That's the truth. That's what you paid me for. Thank you, Mr. King. Thank you. I'll wire you the remainder of the money first thing once the local office opens for business. No rush. It's been a long night and I'm going to take it slow, enjoy some more cold coffee, and maybe uh, order an omelette. Good night, Miss Connolly. I stumble back to my stool, slump over the counter, call for the waitress. After I put in my order, I drop my head on my arm, close my eyes, and dream of whiskey. Detective Ezekiel King survives another thrilling adventure in the house that Satan built. Written and produced by Bernie Gonzalez and featuring the talents of Carrie Gonzalez, Andre Walker, Tamara Fritz, and Bernie Gonzalez. Make sure to tune in next week for another chilling tale of strange detective fiction, all courtesy of our fine sponsors at Kevin R. Cole. Next time you visit your local Kevin R. Cole dealer, Make sure to say Third Eye to get free delivery on your next order. That's right. Just say Third Eye and a courteous Kevin R. Cole man will drop off your winter stock right at your front door, free of charge. We hope you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. Make sure to check under the bed, in your closet, and around the corner before hitting the sack. You never know what mystery awaits after midnight. Good night from the Midnight Mystery Theater and the MMT Broadcasting Network. That's it for this episode. Tune in next time for more fan-to-fan conversations on the Fan-to-Fan Podcast. Thanks for listening. Visit MidnightMystery.net home to the strange adventures of Detective Ezekiel King.